overview chapter. We will set the stage for motor development by discussing its place in the larger scheme of things. First, history. Since we study changes across time and behavior, we also ought to view the changes in motor development as a discipline. Secondly, theories. These theoretical frameworks dominated and will continue to dominate present-day research in motor development. Let's start with history. The history of motor development as a field is rather young. On Table 1-3, Clark and Whittle outlined the major eras that define the field. It might surprise you to know that some major players in science in general have been credited with early motor development studies. Specific dates for the four historical periods are in the table in the text. Here, what is shown are the major players and the major thrusts that they brought along. The precursor era acknowledges the Darwinian roots of motor development. Yes, that is the same Darwin who is credited with the theory of natural selection. Prior to the turn of the 20th century, he wrote a paper called a, bio a Biographical Sketch of an Infant. This is in 1877. Continuing on to the present, to the early, sorry, to the early 20th century, the thrust was to understand the mind, the mind of the child mainly, because it is through movement that the mind is understood. It's through movement that, that the early workings of the brain is reflected. Secondly, maturation. This refers to the dominance of what is called the biological maturation theory. From the early to middle 20th century, maturation dominated and ushered the staunch belief in biology. In particular, the maturation of the brain. It is the main factor that is recognized for development. Third, by the mid to about three quarters of the 20th century, the studies that chronicled normality, or what is average, overwhelmed the field. Thus, normative, descriptive. It describes indices of behavior. It describes the health and state of the child motorically based on what is normal. All that rich data to describe human motor skills, what is normal or not, was the result of this era. Ironically, the descriptive period, with all that data and all that rich chronicling of skills, almost killed the growth of the field as a science. If motor development is all about describing stages and ages, then much is already known. If that's all there is, the field could have simply died. Finally, we are now in the process-oriented era. A renaissance occurred as researchers went beyond describing the behavior, but understanding the how, understanding the mechanisms and processes underlying the emergence, evolution, the decline, and dissipation of movement. Two dominant theories try to explain motor development. This is part of the process-oriented era, but what are they? Theory number one, information processing slash maturation model. Note that I've combined both of them. Any theory will, in the end, seek to explain how motor skills develop. To this day, the remnants of the biological maturation theory remain strong in many areas of science. Combine that with the exponential growth in information technology, the dawn of the information age, with computers, all of that served to generate a synergy that perpetuated this biology-based belief system. With respect to movement per se, it boils down to this. The brain, functioning like a computer, is front and center and will be the main source of motor performance. As it matures, specific behavioral patterns and changes can be tracked. From the most primitive reflexes present in newborns, 
The brain will dictate what emerges. From the reflexive state, it matures and takes over, releasing the system to produce voluntary behavior. In other words, as a newborn, newborn, we were basically a bunch of reflexes. But as the higher centers of the brain, where cognition takes over, it paves the way for voluntary behaviors. Because the mind develops, the computer has been an easy tool to picture the brain and its ability to process information and produce and dictate programs that will make us move. The central nervous system serves as the central processing unit that stores information and programs. The effectors just happen to be the limbs. Our limbs carry out these commands and shape the movement form. Even the language that we use to describe behavior right now are computer-related, motor programs, motor plans. What is the alternative? Well, theory number two, let me make this very clear. What theory number two rejects is a lock, stock, and barrel acceptance of the maturation theory. Theory number two is the dynamical systems theory or model. All right. Newell, Thielen, Kelso, and colleagues. These are the authors quoted in your book. As much as the brain is a recognized powerhouse to effect movement, these authors, through their, through their research, have shown that there are other factors that shape movement and, in addition, influence and shape the brain itself. The scheme that Newell devised is a tripartite model that detailed the influence of the following constraints, organismic or individual constraints. The individual has properties that inherently limit what can and cannot be done. For example, one's height will have a major influence if one can play a center for a basketball team. One's physical structure provides a platform for movement and will at the same time limit what possibilities are available for that individual. Within the organism, of course, is the brain. It is not diminished. It's a very powerful organ, but it does not always have to, have to be the one and only determinant. Consider the environment. Secondly, the brain for all its capabilities is not able to dictate alone. Astronauts move in space. In a gravity-less environment, astronauts jump and hop from point A to point B. If, as maturation proposes, we are programmed or pre-wired to walk all the time anywhere, it should be the same in space. According to the maturation theory, it's a pre-programmed behavior. The brain dictates that we walk. But gravity is a force to be reckoned with. It is an environmental factor that shapes the kind of performance we exhibit. Just as water is a unique environment, where walking long distances is inefficient or downright inadvisable in a deep end of the pool. And so, if the environment is water, what is the likely behavior that we will use from point A to point B? Thus, we swim. The environment can also consist of physical and geographic elements or the socio-emotional aspects of behavior. In terms of socio-emotional context, the presence of supportive, caring, and activity-involved parents will likely develop children who will themselves be active and sport-oriented. Third, task constraints. The task is defined by its goals, rules, and specific maturation. Man manipulations and instructions. The actual behavior must conform to these. The performer eventually shapes the output to fulfill the requirements of the task. Best example for this is in swimming. Up to the early 1950s, 
One of the strokes for competition is described simply as having symmetrical strokes for both upper and lower extremities. At that time, most everyone performed it as the breaststroke. Due to innovation and motivation by a coach and athlete in Iowa, a faster stroke was devised. They managed to follow the task or rule while generating more power in what is now known as the butterfly. The final point in this diagram is that all three factors are interrelated and interdependent. Their confluence together brings about the change in the behavioral outcome. At any point in time, any one of these three or all together can be a major controlling variable that will determine the exhibited behavior. The point is, there is no designated end-all and be-all factor that single-handedly determines behavior. There is no one encompassing factor such as the brain. The brain is sub subsists within the individual. Depending on a specific context, the controlling parameter can change in a dynamic way. It's constantly changing, it's constantly shaping the behavior, thus the term dynamical systems. The human body is one dynamical system constrained by multiple, multiple factors that fall in any of the three major ones described.